Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and tonight, uh, tonight, I think you're going to like tonight. I think you'll like tonight's topic. So uh, what is the topic tonight? So tonight, we're actually going to kind of conclude a series, a mini series. It's sort of a series within a series. Uh, so tonight, we're going to be talking about the third door of liberation. And let me remind you of these doors of liberation. So these are the three doors. Shunyata, Animita, Apranihita. And this is the theme tonight aimlessness or wishlessness. We'll get into the language, but I just wanted to remind you, I'm going to be referencing kind of all three of these at the beginning. So wanted to note that. So yeah, so tonight we're going to talk about this idea of apranihita, which again is normally translated as wishlessness or aimlessness. <clears throat> So um, let's see. So the way that I want to do this tonight, and again, hi, everybody. Welcome. So great to see you all. What a great group. Um, so the way that I was thinking about doing this, so this is a really interesting idea, apranihita. And I was thinking it'd be interesting to try to approach this sort of three different ways tonight. I know that a lot of the ideas that we discuss in the Dharma doors here, I know sometimes it can get like really out there, like really, really philosophical, almost esoteric in that way. And there's a, a way that it, this can seem to be impractical, like this, that it has nothing to do with you, nothing to do with me, nothing to do with practice. And it really does. So I wanna to try to approach this topic tonight and I kind of wanna talk about it at a very, very, very practical level, at a slightly more intermediate level, and then at that really deep Dharma doors level, at which point we'll probably get back into our sutra. Um, but it would actually be, it would be not, well, it wouldn't be fitting actually for me to have a goal here tonight. That is part of this topic tonight, apranihita, meaning again, aimlessness, goallessness would be a way to describe it. And so the idea of me even having my notes and my agenda of what I would like to accomplish tonight, that is not being very apranihita. <laughs> but I am going to still stick to my agenda to discuss this idea. So once again, this idea fits into this kind of rubric that is called the three doors of liberation. And as I've been saying all along, and if you haven't been coming to the Dharma doors lately for many, 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 many weeks now, I've been doing a grand series on the Bodhisattva path. What does it mean to be a bodhisattva? Essentially, what is Mahayana Buddhism? What is this type of Buddhism? And in doing this and talking about the bodhisattva path, one of the things that I kind of keep coming back to is all of these ideas that constitute the bodhisattva path, that are aspects of the path, you can find them all in the early Buddhist tradition. They're all there. So really nothing in the Mahayana tradition is being invented or, or created. It's really about a slightly later form of Buddhism. And when I say slightly, I'm just talking like a few hundred years after the Buddha. So we're still way, way, way a long time ago. But these ideas that become part of the Mahayana tradition, they're all in that early tradition. In particular, these three ideas that I just showed you on the board, I'll show you once again, but these three ideas of emptiness, signlessness, and aimlessness, 
you can find all three of these in the early Buddhist tradition. What you won't find is these three together as a kind of an idea. And so that's what the Mahayana tradition does is it sort of takes these ideas from the early tradition and kind of arranges them in these kind of order or these sets. And so these are these three doors of liberation. And I'm going to need to just remind you of what those three, or at least the first two, I'm going to remind you of what they mean. So this is going to be a very quick review of emptiness and signlessness. But the basic idea of emptiness is, you know, and this is a very subtle one, and I probably shouldn't even attempt to do a quick review of emptiness because it never turns out well, meaning it just goes on and on and on. But the basic idea, and I, I will frame it this way. Actually, this will be a really good way to frame it. These three doors of liberation, whether you're talking about early Buddhism or the Mahayana tradition, these three things, they have to do with what is called samadhi, a type of meditation, a very deep, concentrated form of meditation, this idea of samadhi. And so these are often called three kinds of samadhi. They are also called sort of these three doorways or three gateways to samadhi. <clears throat> it kind of depends. <clears throat> excuse me, depending on who you talk to. So insofar as all of this has to do with meditation, the idea is, is that the, the Buddha gave advice, gave suggestions for various objects of meditation, things to focus on. And Within the world of Buddhism, there's a lot of different things <clears throat> that one can place one's attention on. And in general, of course, the Buddha would suggest the breathing, the act of breathing. But for the sake of what I'm about to talk about, I want to choose an object. <clears throat> and I'm not even going to choose a specific object. I just want to introduce the idea of meditating on something using that something as a point of focus and then as a kind of anchor for sati or smrti for mindfulness one well one becomes kind of fixed anchored on that object and the value and the use of an of a meditative object a focal point the value of that is that as I'm trying to focus and concentrate, if my mind begins to wander, I can bring it back to that object. And so the Buddha recommended these different objects to focus on, to bring your attention to it. Except when we're talking about emptiness, we are talking about the very lack of inherent nature of this object, whatever it is. And that's sort of the first thing I want to mention about emptiness. It goes for everything, anything and everything you could possibly imagine, no matter how small, no matter how big, no matter how complicated, anything and everything that could be an object of focus is actually without an inherent nature. And when I did, I did a whole talk about emptiness, so I'm not going to get too into it. So you can go back to Sunday's classes to kind of learn all about emptiness. But the main thing that I want to remind you of that came out of that class was that there's this funny thing it's a very funny thing about uh, thinking. It's a very funny thing about this world. And it's a funny thing that philosophers have been puzzling over and pondering forever and ever and ever. 
And the funny thing about objects is that, and now I'm probably going to have to grab an object in order to discuss this, but <clears throat> I'll just grab random one, a classic one. What I talked about in that conversation about emptiness. So th this <laughs> is black. This is uh, tangible. It's, it's not a thought. It's an object in that sense. Uh, you might call it a cup, right? And what the idea about emptiness is all about, it's about this object that we're calling a cup. It's about this object that we're calling black. And what I talked about at that, that night, two Sundays ago is, what is black? What is a cup? And when we ask that question, what is the object that is being called a cup? And right there, we notice something, which is that there has been a presumption. And it's the presumption that there's something here that's black, that's a cup, that's this, that's that. And what's funny is, is that philosophers since the days of Plato, since the days of the Buddha, and even before, philosophers have been trying to find what is the thing in itself? What is the underlying object to which these characteristics or qualities are attributed? But without those qualities or characteristics, what is that thing? And I want to tell you, I've mentioned this in uh, Dharma Doors before. I don't think I mentioned it on that Sunday, though. There's a word, two words I want to talk about in English. The first word is the word subject, the subject. In this case, what, what I'm talking about is the subject. This is the subject. But you know what's interesting about that word subject? Sub, you may know, is a prefix that means underneath, like a submarine. <laughs> submarine, right? So subject. Ject, J E C T. Mm, that's the root of words like eject. Eject. To ject, J E C T, that word means to throw. And actually, so what the etymological meaning of the word subject is, is the thing underneath that the qualities are thrown onto. It's the subject. <laughs> and there's another English word that's really interesting too. And I already used it once. It's the word presumption. That word is actually pre-subposition. To a presumption literally means a pre-subposition. So again, we have that idea of the thing, the thing that's underneath, the pre-subposition, the thing that was there already. So it was pre sub it was there. And then we call it black. We call it a cup. We call it a this, we call it a that. But all the while, we've made a grand presumption that there's, hmm, you know, something. <laughs> and of course, as I point out often, Western philosophy and Western science is still digging around in electrons and protons and quarks and muons and is digging around, still trying to find the underlying thing. Whereas Buddhism and the Buddha realized around 500 BC, there is no 
subject. There is no thing underneath all of that. <laughs> it's just a pile of qualities or a pile of characteristics, but like a pile of veils or just a pile of qualities, there's actually nothing underneath. And that is essentially the teaching of emptiness, that all phenomena are a presumption. <laughs> Meaning, again, the underlying thing that is called this, that is called that. So emptiness, Yeah, um, yeah, no, and there are, I wouldn't say Buddhism is alone in this. What I would say, though, is, is that Buddhism is alone for having built an entire religion and practice on this idea. Other traditions are like, maybe there might not be a thing underneath there. <laughs> so, yeah, good question, though. Okay. So my point about emptiness is that it pertains to the object of meditation. And when we thought we were meditating on a cup, or we thought we were meditating on this or that, what this teaching is about is about a, a kind of wisdom or an understanding that there isn't that thing underneath. There's no svabhava, inherent nature. So that's about the object of meditation. Last week, we talked about nimitta, signs or qualities. And then we talked about animitta, the signless, qualityless. And that idea, signless or qualitylessness, is, of course, very related to emptiness, but it actually has a slightly different connotation. And what that connotation is about, and I didn't get actually get too into this last week because of the way it went, but the idea about a, a quality or a characteristic in that sense, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of these. We talked about them. They, all kinds of things classify as qualities. But one aspect of characteristics and qualities that is, it's a big part of this, it has to do with things like, well, a, a really, really important Buddhist idea, for example, is the idea of distinguishing what are called kushala dharma, and akushala dharma, wholesome dharma and unwholesome dharma, also sometimes referred to as pure and impure dharma. So an impure dharma would be something like anger. Anger is considered an impure dharma, and because of its, uh, because it is conducive to suffering, it's considered akushala, it's considered unwholesome, it's considered impure. And there are other dharma, there's other things that are called wholesome, that are called pure, something like uh, loving kindness, metta, that's kind of considered a pure dharma. Now, between these two phenomena, between these two things, anger and loving kindness, one has the quality or the characteristic of being pure, whereas one has the characteristic or quality of being impure. So what I'm getting at is, is that the teaching of signlessness, it has a lot to do with not judging things as being pure or impure, not actually thinking that something is a certain way. And I just talked about that in terms of emptiness. But again, this isn't about necessarily the object. It's about the characteristics that that object is sort of um, 
giving off, if you will, and then the judgment about those characteristics or qualities. Now, this could also go, of course, for things like beautiful and ugly. And the idea here is, is that the very thing that I am judging as beautiful or ugly, we've already talked about how there isn't that thing actually out there. It's going to be a presumption. It's going to be a projection in that way. So in many ways, the teaching of signlessness or characteristiclessness, on the one hand, it's kind of very easy to understand because if there isn't anything actually there, there isn't anything to have the characteristic or quality of being beautiful or ugly or pure or impure. But actually what I want you to kind of be thinking about tonight is how even if I understood the emptiness of the cup, I could still in a way be confronted by the characteristics that I think are a cup and then have all kinds of judgments about those things. And so this aspect of samadhi, this aspect of meditation is about not having that preference or that judgment in that way. Now, there's a lot more to characteristics or nimitta. And again, you can go back to last Sunday to hear an extensive talk about that idea. I just wanted to point out how the first one of emptiness or shunyata, it's about the thing I would be meditating on. Characteristics are sort of about the way the thing makes me feel in that sense. And it would also be about sort of wanting to move towards wholesome dharmas, pure dharmas, and wanting to move away from impure, unwholesome dharmas. So within the world of meditation, we, are, we, we would traditionally want to be kind of aware of characteristics and therefore moving ourselves more towards one type of characteristic, pure or wholesome, and moving away from another. So, of course, what I just did there was setting us up for the third door of liberation. So the third door of liberation is, again, it's usually called wishlessness or aimlessness. Um, I didn't do it at the beginning, so let me do it now. A little quick etymology. So apranihita, classic Sanskrit word, as far as that the A is a negator. So this means not, not pranihita. So pranihita is its own word, is its own idea, but this is apranihita. And the root, the root of this word is prani. So that's kind of a nasally N, prani, right? So prani is a wish. It's a wish. It's a aspiration. It's a goal. It's kind of related to chanda, meaning desire. It's kind of related to those ideas, but it has a very specific connotation within the world of Buddhism. Pranyi is a, a word that you might know from other Dharma talks is pranidana. So P R A N I D H A N A, pranidana. Pranidana is what we would translate as a vow, like vowing to save all sentient beings. A vow to liberate or save all sentient beings is a wish. It's a goal. It's this aspiration. So the first thing I want to point out about prani and pranihita or pranidana, either version of that word, what I want to point out is that it is not, a, it's not considered a bad thing at all, at all, at all. So this idea of prani, this idea of pranihita, it, it doesn't, um, what could I say? 
it it doesn't like stink of craving. Let me put it to you that way. So it doesn't have that connotation. It has a, a very virtuous, palms joined, vow, wish vibe to it. So what are we talking about? Well, in terms of meditation, in the early schools of Buddhism, so what would, what would be called Hinayana, the early form of Buddhism, a, a pranihita or a pranidana in that way, it would be about something like, what are you going to do today? <laughs> well, I'm going to go meditate and I'm going to get into the samadhi of infinite space. Oh, that's what you're going to do today? Yep. I'm going to go to the woods and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> that is a kind of a wish or a vow, a virtuous wish, a virtuous vow to attain a state of samadhi. And of course, one of the interesting ideas that I want to I want to put in here it's a funny thing about like how would you get into the samadhi of infinite space if you didn't want to <laughs> if you didn't set your mind to do that how would you get into that state so the idea is is that you've got to set that intention you got to make that commitment or that vow to then lead you into that state of samadhi. So I want to point, point that out now that normally the idea of pranihita, not apranihita, what we're talking about, but this, this idea of pranihita, it's usually about this sort of going for a certain meditative state. In fact, it's usually about going for enlightenment. <laughs> so going all the way to nirvana, that is like the ultimate pranihita, the ultimate goal, wish, or desire. But this is the teaching about apranihita, having no goal, no wish, no aim, no desire. <laughs> so, that brings us to sort of the more, uh, that was all introductory, of course. Now we're going to talk ap apranihita. But I want to sort of start us off easy. And I want to talk about uh, this teaching, wishlessness, aimlessness, but at its kind of most practical, basic level. I want to give us all a really firm footing before we go forward. And what I'm thinking of is, I'm thinking of a few things. One of the things, I have two ideas in mind. The first one, and I want to, let me start with this one, because we've all been there. <laughs> so, you know how sometimes you might have a bunch of, a bunch of emails you should write, right? You feel like, oh, I got to write all these emails, right? And you don't do it. <laughs> and you never do it. And so whatever those emails were about, <laughs> whatever they would have brought about, had you written them, forget about it. It's not going to happen. You didn't write the emails. But what I'm kind of getting at is, is that we all actually know <laughs> deep down inside <laughs> that none of this really matters <laughs> and that you could write those emails or you could not write those emails the world's not going to fall apart if you do or you don't and through the the just the turning of the sands of time life goes on and there's emails from years ago i've not i haven't thought about them and I, I probably at the time worried greatly about not responding and not doing all of that. And now years later, I look back and I realize it didn't matter unless I wanted something. If I wanted something 
to happen in my life. Like, let's say there was a, a potential job that I wanted to get. And there was an email that I could have written and it would have led to me getting the job, but I didn't write the email. So the person didn't get my reply. And then I never got that job. Now, if I wanted, craved and desired that job that bad, I should have written the email. But what I need to be really aware of as a kind of a, a part of the practice, a part of what we're talking about tonight is realizing that there is no obligation to anybody except our own desires. And the only thing we're gonna miss out on is what we want in that way. But my point is, is that there in the world of Buddhism, you write the emails, you don't write the emails. And there's, it's, it's, it's whatever in a certain sense, but if you want something, <laughs> you're not gonna get it. But my point though is, is that there's this direct relationship between feeling obliged and responsible for things and desire, the things that we want. And so part of the Buddhist practice is actually observing about, observing how we put all of this weight on ourselves. The goals that we have in life, we have created the goals. We've set the standard for what is a good life. We've set the standard for all of that. So when, when we fail to kind of live up to our, our own expectations, it's important to remember that we are the ones that set up those expectations. And we could have easily not had those expectations. So the first very practical level of apranihita that I want to get across is that if, if, if you feel a sense of relief from what I'm saying, if you feel a sense of relief from the idea that all this obligation is self-imposed and you could just as easily unimpose it on yourself, if that teaching sounds good to you, sounds liberative to you, then, well, then pay attention for the next hour because we're going to be talking about kind of the, the deeper aspects of that, of that idea about setting goals, setting expectations, setting desires, and then the dukkha, the suffering and anxiety and stress that arises from having set that as a goal. And we want to realize that I could just as easily unset that as a goal, or at the very least, not cling and be attached to that. In other words, be, be open to the possibility of not, not achieving it in that sense. So does all this make sense so far just regarding goals? So cool, 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 cool. So on that note, I want to I want to point out something a little more subtle. We're still within the real like basic realm though of the just the practical application of this way of thinking. Thinking aimlessly, goallessly. So another way of thinking so this isn't about emails and things like that, but it's a kind of a very modern thing to do. In fact, I found myself um, doing this recently and then sort of reflected on it and, well, thought I would include it in this, in this Dharma talk. So the thing that I started doing just a few days ago, I started setting up these year end goals these things that i wanted to accomplish by the end of the year you know and the thing about it is is that again i don't want to get any of this to get misconstrued if if you want things to happen you you need to take steps to make them happen in that way i'm just pointing out you know that relationship <laughs> with desire 
I have my desires. I have my wants. I want to accomplish certain things. So I set these sort of goals, year end goals, accomplish these few things before the end of the year. But you know what's interesting about what, that? What I noticed, and you know, it's, it's, um, it's summertime, right? It's mid-August, everybody's on vacation. It, it, you know, things are kind of very chill these days, right? So what I noticed was, is that as soon as I set those year-end goals, the way that I was relating to today totally changed. Today was now, you know, this ticking, this ticking away, a day that was ticking away. And that if I didn't take advantage of today, I've only got so many more days left till the end of the year. And so what I'm getting at is, is that a few days ago, I was in this kind of like, hey, what day of the week is it kind of a mode, like where I was at, I was in kind of vacation mode where I didn't really know what day of the week it was. I didn't care what day of the week it was and everything was feeling pretty nice. Then I set these goals and all of a sudden the current day, even though it's still August and sunny and vacation-y, it was no longer the same kind of day, the quality of the day had changed. And what I, of course, what I realized was that it changed because I was now thinking of it relative to this goal of mine. And of course, having the goal in mind created all of this dukkha, all of this anxiety and stress about not finishing my goals. I still have those goals, but I'm trying to be very aware of the way that they are affecting my mind now in that way. So I just wanted to point that out to that kind of relationship of an aim or a goal. And then the way that that affects your disposition towards the present moment. It's no longer the present moment. Again, it's in relationship to that end date, that terminus in that way. All right, that all kind of making sense to everybody, right? Again, real practical stuff to ease us into this. I want us to get, start to get the feeling for what, what is aimlessness? What is goallessness? Well, it is that state of, well, let me start to, I'll put it to you this way. I'm gonna start easing us towards the deeper stuff. So one of the things about that's really beautiful about this idea of apranihita, goallessness. Yeah, I'll bring, mention this now in, in case I don't, I think I should. So there's a, a little uh, Buddhist analogy, a little Buddhist story that I like to tell. I, I tell this often, most of you have heard this uh, many, many times, but I wanna introduce it again. The Buddhist story, or it's just a quick little um, metaphor, I guess. The Buddha says, it's like this. There's someone lost in the woods. They don't know north, south, east from west. They don't have a compass. And there's not a star in the sky. They're completely lost. The Buddha says, the moment the person no longer cares where they're going, they're no longer lost. Just like that. Now, that is actually a little metaphor for apranihita, for aimlessness or goallessness. And the beauty of that little story is noticing how when we wanted to get somewhere, when we had a goal, an aspiration, and then it, it, it allowed for the dukkha, it allowed for the feeling of being lost, it allowed for the feeling of needing help, it allowed for all of these feelings. But the moment the mentality of the person changes, 
they're no longer lost. And the beauty of that, a way that you could describe that, is being and feeling like you're exactly where you need to be, that there's nowhere else to go, that this is it. And any aim, any goal, any desire is going to stir me out of being peace, being at peace here now. So it's about noticing that you, in a way, have everything you need, have everything in that sense. But it's our own desires, it's our own aversions, it's our own confusion that stir us out of that. And we start setting up all these goals to go here, to go there, whatever it is. And then, of course, as soon as we have goals, now we're looking for signs. Should I go that way? Should I go that way? Which is the right way? So again, what I'm trying to do is to kind of create a feeling for a pranihita. A pranihita, it, again, is the feeling of being so content, there's nothing more to do. One more thing that I want to say, I have this list of things that I just want to make sure I get in here. So regarding a pranihita, this goallessness, I know that when we first start hearing about this, we first start hearing about this idea, a, a, there's a, a kind of a, a line of reasoning. It's a, it's a rationale, it's a rationalization, but it's about this idea of need, feeling as if one needs to do things, feeling as if one needs to do things. And in particular, if we, if we were to get into a conversation, a discussion about this, and I have been in many of these conversations, it might come up that, but I need to eat. <laughs> I, I, need to, I need to do stuff because I need to make money because I got to eat and all of this and this and that. <clears throat> the thing about that argument, and trust me, I get it. I, I totally understand that argument, but you know what is so beautiful about the Buddhist tradition? The Buddha not only gave us this tremendous wisdom, the Buddha also, by the way, and probably doesn't get enough credit for this, the Buddha also created one of the first social security networks where there is an organization that has arms wide open with plenty of food. And in fact, you could show up naked because we have a clothing for you too. We've got a uniform, we got food. It's called the Sangha. It's called the Buddhist organization. They're all over the world. They're even in the United States. They're probably in every major city. And the Buddha set up this social security network because he was suggesting to people that they drop out of society, because he was suggesting that the, this, the rat race, the rat race is driving everybody crazy. Now, if the Buddha had just said the rat race is driving you crazy, and then said good luck, that would be one thing. But again, we don't have any excuses. If we're down to that level of pure survival, like, no, I have to be worrying about all of this stuff because I have to survive? No, <laughs> you can renounce. It is an option. If you don't want to renounce because you like having creature comforts and stuff and all of that, it's just about owning up to the fact that you want them. And so you need to do things to satisfy your wants. But that includes maybe some dukkha or some anxiety or stress with that too. So choice is yours in that way. Okay, everybody feeling okay with everything that's going on so far? Yeah, no. <clears throat> um, when you first talked about pranyahita, you were talking about it as distinct from sort of the more, uh, you know, 
sensual desire, the, the, the normal desire that it, it's this higher aspiration, like, you know, may all beings be free. That's, you know, so how does that fit into what you just said? I mean, I don't want to mince words, uh, but like, is it? Uh... Yep. So on that note, no, <clears throat> Apranihita is <clears throat> more about, <clears throat> excuse me, it's more about these higher spiritual goals, in particular, meditative goals in that way. I'm just trying to make it practical to our lives. Yeah, no, you did call, you caught me in that way where I was sort of conflating normal sort of chanda, normal desires and wants with long-term goals or aspirations. And apranihita isn't exactly about mundane goals of life. Yeah, I was just trying to make it applicable. Okay, but we'll we'll kind of get to how to the not how the ah pranyahita, not just ah desire. Got it. Okay, thank yep. you. Everybody else doing okay? No, I will say this though. the The reason why I wanted to go through all of that is you know starting with emails and we i think we all know like how that can feel or how that can be so whether it's that i just kind of wanted to again create a feeling for what this is and it's this really feeling of it's almost you know like <laughs> the best moment of your life meaning that moment when you didn't need or want anything else that you whether you were on the beach in Hawaii or whether you were in bed with a lover or whatever it is, that feeling of, oh, I'm good. I, like, I don't, that feeling, but that feeling that you could induce in yourself through meditation. So let's find out how to do that. No, cool. Everybody else doing good? All right, so to get to the deeper Dharma, I'm going to rely on Manjushri Bodhisattva. We're going to return to our text, and I'm going to walk us through what is really starting to seem like the crux, the, the heart of this sutra. So Noam just put the link there. That's the to English version from Tibetan that I've been reading. If you have that version, I'm going to be reading line 1.234. Um, I'm not going to be reading from that translation, though, so just let it be known that it's going to sound a little different if you're looking at that version. So really quick, just to recap, this sutra has been going on for a very long time. And I mean, we're talking many, many pages, many things have happened. But we have finally reached this sort of critical moment where two bodhisattvas are having a discussion. Uh, Manjushri Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva of Wisdom, and a Bodhisattva named Lion Courage. And the Bodhisattva Lion Courage has been asking the great Bodhisattva Manjushri all of these questions regarding enlightenment. In particular, the Bodhisattva Lion Courage, he set up these questions by first asking about the past. Or actually, I think he starts by asking about the future of when will Manjushri become fully enlightened? When will he become a Buddha? And Manjushri basically doesn't answer. And he says something to the effect of, I'm not seeking enlightenment, which is kind of a hint about a pranihita. So then the Bodhisattva Lion Courage says, well, when in the past, when, when did you like first become a Bodhisattva and like first start heading towards enlightenment? Manjushri won't answer that question either. And then that leads the Bodhisattva to asking Manjushri, well, then you're enlightened right now. Or like, what's then what's going on right now? And this conversation that about 
the Bodhisattva Manjushri's state status right now, there have been a few aspects, aspects to that. And then we finally reach this section where Manjushri has been talking about samatha, not shamatha, not calming, but samatha, equalness, sameness, equanimity, equality. And ultimately, Manjushri has settled on this idea of equanimity, equality, all dharmas being equal, all phenomena being equal, equally empty, of course, but all equal in that way. And so no here or there, no, it's all samatha in that way. And so the bodhisattva being intrigued by this state of equanimity, by this state of equalness, asks Manjushri, what is realizing equanimity? What is it to realize this state? He's basically kind of asking how to reach this state, but that's where we're at in the text. And so there's a really powerful paragraph answer that Manjushri gives. And so I want to go through it really, really slowly. Yeah, we got plenty of time for this. So Manjushri answers the Bodhisattva saying, to be without attachment to all dharmas, to all phenomena, is called realizing equanimity. To say one has entered realization of equanimity. That is that subtle wisdom, which also does not arise and does not cease, is no different from true suchness, incapable of being differentiated. So, just in those two sentences, there's a lot of ideas. The first one, of course, shouldn't be a, shouldn't sound like a big surprise if you're a student of Dharma. To be without attachment to all Dharmas is called equanimity. So non-attachment, of course, is the name of the game, right? But this, of course, isn't your early form of Buddhism. This is Mahayana Buddhism. So when it says to be without attachment to all dharmas is called realizing equanimity, in that, included within that, is not just like my cup and this and that. They're talking also about the dharma like the teachings of the Buddha, like the wisdom, like the sutras, like all of the Dharma. So this is actually very profound because Manjushri is saying to be without attachment to anything, even Buddha Dharma, even the teachings of the Buddha. And of course, this is a very important part of Mahayana Buddhism. It's summarized it's often summarized in what is called the parable of the raft. The parable of the raft is a very, very old Buddhist teaching. It's from the Pali suttas, but the parable of the raft is actually a very old sutta where the Buddha says, it's only a fool who after they've used a raft to get from this shore to, up to the other shore, it's only a fool that picks the raft up and carries it on their head. The raft is a tool to get you from one side to the other. But once you're on the other side, he says, you let the raft go. In that sutta, he says, all these teachings, all of my dharma is like that raft. It's all just a tool to get you to the other shore. But once you're on the other shore, 
you can let go of the Dharma too. So that's a very kind of profound teaching in that way, that even Buddhism is just a provisional setup that needs to eventually be abandoned or not attached to. So to be without attachment to all dharmas is called realizing true equanimity. Because of course, if I were elevating the Buddha Dharma over, oh, I don't know, Christianity or Islam or some other religion, if I were saying that Buddhism's better than these, that would be very delusional in that sense. And so true equanimity is that Buddhism is Buddhism and Christianity is Christianity. And one is not better or worse than the other in that way. In fact, all dharmas are equal in that sense, all phenomena. So that's the first part of our answer. To say one has entered realization, that is that subtle wisdom, he says, which also doesn't arise or cease. So the language of arising and ceasing, of course, goes back to the heart of this um, sutra. It's a teaching we've gone over before. I don't want to get too into it now, but it is also very much a, a very different teaching than the Hinayana in that way. In the early Buddhist schools, they were really into observing the arising, abiding, and ceasing of phenomena, of dharmas. That was part of the tradition. So you would observe various phenomena arise and cease. This is the teaching, though, about no, the non-arising of all dharmas, the not coming and the not going of all phenomena. And to say that one has entered the realization of equanimity, that subtle wisdom also doesn't arise or cease. Now, let me just point this out because the next line is that this subtle wisdom that doesn't arise or cease, it's no different than Buddha Tathata. It's no different than true suchness, incapable of being differentiated. So that, those series of ideas, not arising and ceasing, being the same as suchness, incapable of being differentiated. So it's kind of a, it's a very, very subtle teaching, but we're uching our way towards this apranihita. So one, it, this is a really another classic one that I use a lot to describe not arising and not ceasing. It's another teaching uh, or another thing I use to describe suchness. So if you're looking at the screen, oh, look at that. You'll notice that there is what you might call a fist. Look, it's my fist. And the question is, where did the fist go? Did it, did it go over there? Did it go over there? Like, where is it? Like, where did it go? A related question is, where did it come from? Was it born? Was it created? Did I just destroy it? Did I just shatter the fist? No, right? There's either the conditions for a fist, or there are not the conditions for a fist. But the fist doesn't come from anywhere, and it doesn't go anywhere. Now, if you understand that about this fist, about how it, it kind of has an existence, 
because like look <laughs> the fist so th there's kind of a way undeniably a fist it is such behold the fist where we get confused is thinking that the fist came from somewhere or goes somewhere and the idea of course let me point out another one for you i don't know if i've done this one lately I'll point this one out but so this is a this is an object right this is a phenomena now the idea here is is that you might think i i mean i have an idea of what you think in that way right now what i'm getting at or with this one in particular what i want to what I want to get at is the role of toilet paper. We might think that the role of toilet paper was manufactured somewhere. It, it, it didn't exist. And then a manufacturing plant created this roll of toilet paper, put it in a package with some other rolls of toilet paper, sent it to the store, I went to the store and I got the roll of toilet paper. And as I use the roll of toilet paper, it's going away. And when I peel off that last little piece, it's gone. That would be thinking that the roll of toilet paper comes into existence, is existing, but will someday not exist except what if what if you were from some country some region that didn't use toilet paper didn't have a mind conditioned to think of a yellow cylinder or sorry a white cylinder a mind that didn't think that that was useful to a bathroom, useful as sanitary paper. In fact, what if I told you that this is actually a really, really delicate scarf? It's a really, really, really long, delicate scarf that I keep rolled up to keep it nice and, and crisp. It even has this beautiful embossed decoration on it and the beautiful thing about it is is if i get colder i can add more to my scarf so where was my scarf manufactured <laughs> right or is the scarf and the roll of toilet paper actually like a fist meaning when it's being experienced as a roll of toilet paper it's a roll of toilet paper and it didn't come from anywhere it doesn't go from any go anywhere but when it be perceived as a roll of toilet paper it be perceived as a roll of toilet paper but if it be perceived as a scarf behold it's a scarf and by the way this is undeniably a scarf I'm, I'm, I'm getting warm, in fact, and then I have to take it off is the point. So what I'm getting at is, and this is tying together a lot of other Dharma talk lessons, but it's about how the role of toilet paper is a concept, is an idea. And the only place that that exists is in the mind of the beholder, so to speak. So there's no role of toilet paper out here and therefore it's empty and therefore it is neither sanitary nor unsanitary meaning it's not a clean roll of toilet paper nor is it a defiled roll of toilet paper and the idea is is that it is such meaning that if one is experiencing it as a roll of toilet paper that's it and if it's being experienced as a scarf that's it so rewind to say that one has entered the realization of equanimity that is that subtle wisdom 
And that subtle wisdom also doesn't come from anywhere, doesn't go anywhere, is no different than suchness, incapable of being differentiated. This is called entering realization of equanimity. If one cultivates the practice of right view, there is not a single dharma that can be attained within equanimity. And one transcends grasping at the nature of multiplicity or unity. So, if one cultivates right view. So, regarding samyak drishti or samadhisti, right, this right view, in the early Buddhist tradition, there's a few different definitions of what it means to have the right view. And by right view, they mean viewing the world the right way, thinking about the world the right way. And in the early Buddhist tradition, the right view normally was basically summarized as understanding that all phenomena is impermanent. That was sort of the right view of early Buddhism. That if you keep that in mind, if you keep in mind that all things are impermanent, and you keep that as the view, as your right view, then you're off on the eightfold path, so to speak. I often like to say, or also summarize, by saying that the Mahayana tradition, one of the ways that you can kind of think of the difference between early Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism is that right view in Mahayana Buddhism, it's more about emptiness than it is about impermanence. Everything's impermanent, you know, don't get it twisted. Like that is, that is true. It's just, there's this one addition, which is that the thing, the thing that you think this is, is it's not that, it's empty. So there isn't even a roll of toilet paper to be impermanent. But you thinking this is a roll of toilet paper, that's impermanent. You will not have that idea forever. So, so there's a way in which Mahayana Buddhism is still in step with early Buddhism they just sort of focused on a few ideas from that early tradition. One particular is this idea of emptiness. So here, when it says, if one cultivates practice with right view, there's not a single dharma that can be attained. Now, if you understand or understood what I was talking about in terms of the fist and that there's no fist out here. There's just a mind that might perceive this configuration as a fist and call it a fist. There's no roll of toilet paper. If you understand all of that, you understand how there isn't a roll of toilet paper out here to be grasped, to be attained. There's not a cup over here to be grasped or attained. In fact, there's not a single existent dharma to be attained. And ultimately, what I want to point out is that that's the idea of emptiness. That there's not a single dharma to be attained. And one, so they're not being a single dharma, one can attain, and one transcends grasping at the nature of multiplicity and unity. So that's actually a really, really important idea. 
Let me put it to you this way. How many? There's another piece of information that you need, right? Before you can answer that question, right? What am I talking about? Am I talking about fingers or am I talking about hands? One hand, five fingers. What I'm getting at is, is that within the world of kind of spirituality, call it, uh, within the world of philosophy, there's this teaching of non-duality. We've talked about it in the past. Non-duality. Due, two, right? Non-two, non-duality. A very tempting thing to think about is, oh, not two, that means one. So non-duality is like unity, right? Not from the Buddhist point of view, because the very idea of unity is dualistic as it pertains to multiplicity. And so even by thinking in terms of oneness, one does not escape duality. You actually really need to <laughs> embrace duality in that sense. And so the idea here is, is that when it says that in, with this correct view, with this right view, there's not a single dharma that can be attained, and one transcends grasping at the nature of unity and multiplicity. And you could slip into a samadhi just by thinking about that, <laughs> just by being like, whoa, wait a minute. If it's, if it's not one and it's not multiple, I, I don't have anything to think about. Like it, it, it's, it truly becomes inconceivable in that way. So I want you to notice this connection with emptiness and then this kind of, it transcends the idea of even unity and diversity or multiplicity. All right, everybody doing okay with that part? Awesome. So that's about emptiness. So now check this out. Oh, by the way, each of these sections, it ends with, and that is called entering or realizing uh, uh, equanimity. So being beyond unity and multiplicity, that's called entering the realization of equanimity. And then the next line. If one's self, so if you, you, yourself, if one realizes all dharmas lack characteristics and understands that their characteristic is what is called characteristiclessness and under, sorry, if one understands and realizes that all dharmas lack characteristics, and understands that their characteristic is what is called characteristiclessness, and therefore does not cling to body or mind. This is then called complete, perfect realization of equanimity. So from emptiness or the idea that there's not a single Dharma to be attained, we then move to the second door of liberation, this idea of characteristiclessness. And so this uh, sentence has said something that kind of really embodies uh, Mahayana Buddhist philosophy. And it's the idea that all phenomena, all things, even though that you think this is black and this is white, all phenomena, ultimately lack characteristics and 
in that sense, all phenomena are characterized by having the same characteristic, which is not having characteristics. <laughs> That's kind of the, what the text called in an earlier part, that one flavor that all dharmas taste the same. They all taste empty. They all taste characteristicless. So not hopefully so that it won't go unnoticed. Um, oh, by the way, I will mention this. There's a very conspicuous part of this sentence. Curious how the Tibetan does it. So the Tibetan has it as when this is actualized and experienced directly. The idea of this direct experience in the Chinese version that I'm kind of reading from, it's, it emphasizes that this is a, an experience that one just needs to have oneself. And this is kind of, there are certain aspects of the Dharma or certain aspects of Buddhism where it comes down to actually, there's no other way to talk about this, no other way to articulate this. It's just something one needs to experience themselves. So this is one of those things. And it says, again, that if one has that direct realization oneself, one realizes all dharmas lack characteristics and understands that their characteristics is what is called characteristiclessness and therefore doesn't cling to body or mind. So the thing about this is this. I could be up here and I could tell you about the cup I could tell you about rolls of toilet paper. I could tell you about all of these things. I could show you all of my optical illusions and all of that. And I can, if I'm successful, I can kind of instill in you an understanding of emptiness, right? An understanding of signlessness. But the thing about it is, is that if you really understand what I've been talking about. And in particular, you understand, you understand what it means when I say that this teaching of emptiness and signlessness is applicable to all dharmas, no matter what it is. Even if we're talking about the sun, the moon, also an idea, also a concept, also empty in that way. If you understand how this is applicable to all dharmas, then there are two dharmas that are very interesting to think about in terms of emptiness and characteristiclessness. And it's the body that you think is you and the mind that you think is thinking about this. Those are two dharmas that are also empty signifiers. And that's probably the hardest to understand. But the teaching is, <clears throat> it's, it's one of those things where you just have to kind of understand that I'm not talking about cups and toilet paper. I'm talking about the very way that we think. And so it doesn't matter what we're talking about. If it's an object, if it's a thing with a name and distinguishable characteristics that make it that thing, we've been talking about how all of that is superimposition, projection, right? Hypostasis is another word, just fabricating ideas. But the two hardest ones to understand is how this 
body that I think I inhabit could be empty and characteristicless, and then how the very mind could be in that way too. So now bring it full circle. I know I only have a little time left, but now the last, this apranihita. Apranihita now, it doesn't have to do with year end goals. <laughs> It doesn't have to do with writing emails and all of the things I said at the beginning. And now it's a pranihita. If we understand that emptiness is about the object of meditation, a, a signlessness is about the qualities of that thing, a pranihita is about this idea that, well, I'm going to get enlightened. I'm going to practice. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to calm down. I'm going to do all these things. And the idea is, is that when you realize that last part of it, that even the body and the mind are empty, that in a way puts one, if I could still use that word, one, but the idea is, is that within that framework, it's not that Michael, let me just use that idea. It's not about Michael being without a goal. It's not about Michael not having an aim. It's actually about understanding that there is no Michael there to have an aim. There's no Michael there to have a goal. And so that would be the kind of the deepest level of this idea of a pranihita, where it's not about you not having a goal. It's about understanding that underneath all of this, that there is no goal maker. There's no goal achiever in that way. All right, questions, comments, answers, ideas about any and all of that. Cool, I just realized, I'm glad I didn't miss this. Lion Courage, before this section ends, <clears throat> Lion Courage has one more question. Manjushri, so then what's called attainment? Attainment, of course, is this big Buddhist word. It's, it's uh, in Sanskrit, it's samapati. And the idea is, is again, is like, like, aren't we trying to get enlightened or liberated or, or like, they're, so they're like, what's, what's going on here then <laughs> is basically what Lion Courage is like. So then what's attainment? And Manjushri answers. Actually, let me. One second. I'm going to read from the uh, uh, other version. <clears throat> what is attainment? And Manjushri answered. Attainment is just a conventional verbal expression. In fact, what saints attain is inexpressible. And why? Because the Dharma rests upon nothing and is beyond speech. Furthermore, to regard non-attainment as attainment and as neither attainment nor non-attainment, that is called true attainment. <laughs> Otherwise, <clears throat> you could also say attainment is just a worldly expression. What all sages attain cannot be expressed in words. And how so? The Dharma relies on nothing because it transcends all expression. 
by attaining without any attainment, and also neither attaining nor not attaining. This is called attainment. <laughs> so that last part speaks to the idea of pranihita, the idea of a goal or attainment, but in this really, you know, neither nor this and that kind of a way. So, you know, you can kind of think about that in a more koan-esque way in terms of the attainment that is not an attainment and beyond all attainments, that's attainment. <laughs> All right, everybody, I think that's going to do it. Any last questions, comments, answers, ideas? All right, I hope that has helped somewhat.